Yeah, so today I wanted to tell you guys uh, a little bit about some fairly recent work uh, with Andreas Blomart, who's at uh, Trieste, and Luca Yesio um, will be talking after me, uh, and who's at Stanford. Um, well, what I'll be talking about. Click on your slide. Yeah. So in this talk, um, I will discuss and uh, propose a possible resolution of uh, two puzzles, um, some of which we've heard about already in Phil's talk. So that's the, uh, the factorization puzzle. And another puzzle that I will talk about um, related is how does the gravitational path integral reproduce a discrete boundary spectrum? Now, if we do a naive bulk gravity calculation, we'll find, as was also explained in, in Phil's talk, that if we calculate the product of partition functions just on the boundary, we just get the product. But if we then translate this through ADS CFP, um, it seems naively that um, there's connected contributions uh, which cause um, an inequality here. Similarly, if we calculate uh, the partition function, so we just have one boundary, one set of boundary conditions, and we calculate um, the gravitational contributions with that boundary, with those boundary conditions, um, we in general don't find a discrete spectrum. And the, the density of states is a continuous function. Uh, for instance, to make this more concrete, you can think about calculating um, gravitational contributions in ABS5 cross S5 in the supergravity approximation. That won't give you a factorizing answer, um, but the belief is that including all topological uh, corrections or stringy corrections in the bulk that you should find um, an equality here and, and here. So you have a factorizing uh, boundary theory or a factorizing result from the gravity calculation and the gravity theory also tells you that there's a discrete boundary spectrum. And this of course hinges all from uh, on the expectations from ADS CFD. So I'll take that as uh, this expectation as, as, as my starting point. Now, of course, uh, including all these topological and stringy corrections is very complicated, it's difficult to uh, enumerate all possible contributions, and then you need to sum them up as well, which could again give you some uh, difficulties with convergence and etc. So what I have in mind today, um, I want to sort of find a toy model, uh, of in, in particular in 2D gravity, that could resolve these, these two uh, puzzles. And sort of the idea here is that um, so this is an idea, we haven't made this precise, but it's sort of why I want to uh, study the theory that I'm about to, to study. Is let us imagine starting uh, from a UV complete higher dimensional theory that we know factorizes. And for instance, consider uh, the near horizon region uh, of a near extremal black hole. Now, in that ADS2 throat, um, usually we make some approximations to get uh, JT gravity. But now what I want to do is to integrate all degrees of freedom except for a dilaton and a 2D metric. So that my 2D theory uh, contains not only JT, uh, but JT with uh, some complicated deformations. And this could be anything really. It could even be non-local contributions because I want to uh, integrate out these degrees, additional degrees of freedom exactly. And again, here I don't have a an, 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 uh, proposal of, of doing this, um, starting explicitly from some UV complete higher dimensional theory. But this is sort of the idea that JT gravity um, arises here with possible non-local contributions. And if this higher dimensional theory factorizes, then there must also be versions of JT gravity that also factorize and have a discrete boundary spectrum. And so the idea would be today to, um, to look at uh, 
these non-local deformations of JT gravity um, that give rise to um, the discrete and factorizing uh, theory to all orders in the genus expansions. So I first wanted to flash the, some of the results and takeaway messages before sort of showing some of the things that we, we, have, we did in our paper. <coughs> All right. So we're going to study JT with uh, a non-local dilettante potential. That will be our starting point. That's the theory that we are going to consider. So there will be a local um, part in our action. This will just be the usual JT piece plus a, a potential. And for now, these things are, are, are arbitrary. And then there's going to be a bilocal term. There could be multi-local terms. I didn't write them. Um, and for the bilocal term, I, I separated out a factor e to the minus two s naught. So again, remember that e to the minus s naught is our genus counting parameter. Now, I will show that to get factorization, it's uh, necessary and sufficient um, for U2 to be the only non-zero uh, non-locality in the, in the JT action, in this non-local JT action. All these multi-local guys are not necessary. Furthermore, this um, U2 um, is, is a rather universal form, and that just follows from the fact that the wormhole in JT also has a rather universal form. Um, and this non-local contribution uh, is small, it's suppressed by e to the minus two s naught. Then furthermore, um, this u is fixed by demanding a discrete spectrum, where the discrete spectrum is um, chosen by taking the JT ensemble and drawing an Hamiltonian from the ensemble. I will denote that Hamiltonian with h naught. For a typical draw, again, U is suppressed, it's small. So what this means is that the corrections that I will be talking about are actually small, small corrections to the usual JT gravity uh, calculations. An important part here about this non-locality is the fact that um, we create correlation between different parts of the space-time. And not only uh, different parts of the same connected part of the space-time, but also between dis different uh, regions, um, different disconnected regions. That could be regions that both have a asymptotic boundary, but that could also mean uh, regions, uh, space-time components that are disconnected, um, like I've drawn here. And again, I'm emphasizing that these correlations are small. So the, these um, closed universes that you see here, they're gonna play an important role. Now, alternatively, these, um, uh, these dilaton potentials, these U, U and U2, um, they can be expanded in e to the minus s naught. And so they appear inside the action. And just as Maxfield, Toriyashi, and, and Witten showed, um, by having a gas of uh, defects, you can have changes to the dilaton potential. And Similarly, uh, in the way that we're thinking about these changes in the dilaton potential, you can also view them as a gas of boundaries. So that's because we have this extra power of e to the s naught. Um, now, they can also be thought of as FCC T brains that instead create uh, geodesic um, boundaries in our world sheet or in our space time. Um, instead of the usual fixed energy ones that uh, that these brains usually uh, create. And they have a non-trivial wave function on them. It's a bit like the, uh, the overlap of the B psi alpha that, uh, that Phil had. So we'll have JT gravity, uh, we'll have contributions of geometries like this. Now, the novelty uh, will be that these boundaries uh, have a non-trivial multi-boundary wave function, uh, similarly as link, uh, the linked uh, wormhole, for instance, uh, that Phil was talking about. Um, so 
So I will present these uh, correlations by a wiggly, uh, a wiggly blue line, and the blue boundaries are the geodesic boundaries. Um, so for instance, we can have uh, these two boundaries can be correlated. Um, you can have three boundaries correlated with a trivalent vertex. And furthermore, there can also be contributions where um, the boundaries are correlated, but they, these geometries that you're correlating do not all necessarily include a asymptotic boundary. Um, and by demanding factorization and discreteness of the spectrum, um, you can find a unique form of these wave functions. And sometimes I will also call these uh, correlation functions or brain correlation functions. Um, now, surprisingly, uh, to get factorization to all orders in the genus expansion, it is enough to factorize the genus zero wormhole. So if I can satisfy this, um, uh, this equation that fixes the brain two-point function or this two-boundary, the connected part of the two-boundary wave function, this will be enough to have factorization to all orders in the genus expansion. Now, demanding that factorization causes the calculation of the partition function, z of beta, to collapse to just two geometries, the disk, and um, um, the half wormhole, as uh, Schenker, Stanford, and, and Ya yeah, also discussed. But that's it. That's the only two geometries that contribute. And the wave function that you put here is, um, is fixed by demanding a discrete spectrum for zero beta. Now, something that I won't be talking about, but I think is very interesting, is that this localization to a discrete uh, spectrum can also be achieved beyond perturbation theory in E to the minus S naught uh, from a certain double trace deformation of the JT gravity patent uh, matrix model. Um, so again, there you see that only bilocal uh, interactions is enough to, uh, to get factorization. All right, so let me get into the, uh, uh, the weeds uh, a little bit, but maybe there are some questions. <clears throat> yes. So just so I understand, are you presenting a, an existence proof of such a theory where it factorizes, or are you claiming that this is the theory that if, if you did that integrating out, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, to be left just with the dilaton and 2D metric, this is what you would get? Or are you just showing that it's possible to get something that factorizes? Yeah, the starting point will be this non-local action. And I'm showing that um, if you allow for just by local uh, interactions, then uh, you can get the theory that, uh, that factorizes. So it's more like a, an, an existence proof. I don't have like uh, the higher dimensional theory and do the exact reduction and like show you, oh, this is the, the 2D gravity theory. Yeah. So there could be something more general than what you're going to show us that would also work. I mean, the results sort of what I'm show you is that um, uh, that the non locality is rather universal. And, um, uh, and so that makes us believe that it might, it might also be the case that in higher dimensional examples, you can have something similar. Uh, yeah. It, uh, Daniel. So um, just adding this one potential, are you going to say this is enough to make the Part of two partition functions factorized, but what about three or five or seven or ten yeah, partition everything. functions? Those are all going to factorize. Yeah. Everything factorizes if I just have the bilocal. Just add the bilocal one. Yeah, I'll, I'll show that. Yeah, yeah. It's maybe a similar question to the previous one, but so is it? Is there any hint that by dimensionally reducing that higher dimensional setup, you should get some non-local effect? And that's why you're including that uh, non-local dilaton potential, or is just uh, an assumption that you take for granted, and then hopefully find a higher dimensional theory. I would say there is a, some scalar field, for instance, with some mass. Then I want to integrate out exactly. Let's say it's a free scalar, right? I integrate out exactly. I get some trace log. That will be a non-local term. Um, but th yeah, this one would be more. Uh, and similarly, I would imagine that integrating out the massive string states or things like that will also reproduce non-localities. Yeah. 
All right, so let me um, try to convince you that uh, the bilocal guy is not. All right, so first, um, just a bit of formulas. Um, so we have JT gravity with some geometries that include additional geodesic boundaries. And so I wanna take the perspective using these additional boundaries instead of the dilaton potential, although they're equivalent this brain picture or this extra boundary picture is a bit more convenient. Um, so if I look at the connected, uh, in this theory, if I can uh, look at the connected uh, two-point function, um, then uh, there kind of, there's gonna be the connected JT contribution. And then there's gonna be contributions that, uh, that come from the brains. So this, for instance, uh, is, uh, two trumpets, two trumpet geometries, and they're connected by this uh, brain correlator. Um, but you can also have uh, the two trumpets connecting to a three-hole sphere, and then there's another boundary um, where this brain one-point function sits, or the, the single boundary wave function, whatever language you would prefer. Now, these, um, these Z-brain uh, uh, functions um, they will depend on this uh, B parameter, so that's the length of the geodesic boundary. Um, and these, these, these will be connected correlators. So I'm just looking at the, at the connected uh, correlators. And these guys, these Z brain wave functions, will also, uh, we also allow them to have an e to the minus S naught expansion, which starts at an appropriate power uh, if you consider. Um, different observables in this guy. Um, all right, now let's look at the uh, leading order uh, factorization. So this is all um, e to the uh, zero times S naught. So this is order one. And then there's two geometries that contribute. There's the, uh, the usual JT wormhole uh, that we know and love. And then there is a contribution that comes from the brains. So that's, um, that's a contribution where we have two trumpets and they are correlated, the two geodesic boundaries are correlated through, um, through the brain two-point function. And um, now I want this to be zero. And so remember that I'm looking at the connected correlator. Phil had the full correlator, so his equation um, had some uh, disconnected uh, part here on the right-hand side. <clears throat> I'm gonna require for factorization that this is zero. Now this immediately tells me to leading order in the genus expansion that the brain two point function, or this two boundary weight function is given by minus one over B1 delta B1 minus B2. That just follows from the, um, from the way you glue two trumpets um, in this wormhole case. Um, and then the minus sign is, is, is obvious because we want to cancel. Um, now, in more general situations, uh, the two boundary uh, uh, correlator, the connected part, will have a contribution like this. Um, and there will be a, uh, some region in between. I call that sigma. It will contain uh, all kinds of geometric contributions, some, some higher genus surface. It could also contain various brain correlators that, um, uh, that are inserted. But sort of the um, contribution besides this are uh, the following three that you also can write down in terms of this, uh, in this uh, JT model with brains. Um, and you can sprinkle these, um, these brain two-point functions um, on either side of, of sigma. So you have a contribution like this. This contributes to the same order in the genus expansion. This guy as well. And then finally, you have this, um, this, this final guy when you put two brain correlators. Um, now, from the previous result, we sort of know that um, the connected uh, correlator, the connected uh, geometry um, is equal to minus the brain uh, correlator. That was the requirement for factorization to leading order. Now, because if we cut the geometry um, along these external legs, so these will be called, I call these external legs. And when I cut that right here, um, 
that's a cycle that's homotopic to the uh, asymptotic boundary. And the mapping class group um, acts sort of trivially on that, that part. So we'll just give you a factor of Z, which um, uh, restricts the range of the twist parameter that you'll have there. And um, the gluing there is precisely this, this delta function. And so what this means is that because the mapping class group is so simple there, um, we can replace these brain correlators um, by, the, uh, by the connected geometry up to a sign. So that means that um, if I do that for the first geometry here, this brain correlator, I can replace that um, with minus this guy. So that's this minus one here. The same I can do for um, the following geometry that also gives me a single minus sign, gives me another minus one. And then for this geometry, it gives me a plus one. And so I have this original purely geometric um, uh, contribution times something that's zero. And so that means that um, even this very complicated geometry that also contributes to the connected part also factorizes. So this will also be zero. Um, now, this means that there's no higher genus corrections to um, this brain two-point function. And so the, we already found the exact result by doing the genus zero factorization. Now, uh, as was already asked, um, you can also apply the same logic when you uh, go to uh, observables that contain more bonds. Yes. We don't have to worry about other brains inside the genus G surface that you're doing? No, because well, for any. The same cancellation outside. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's sort of the beauty of it, because if you would have to worry about that, you need to get into the weeds of uh, mapping class group uh, constraints that are becoming very complicated. But, but here you have to require the correlation give you in fact minus sign. Right? Yeah. Uh, okay. I guess the, the, your equation that you started from ended up being the same as saying that we don't have any connecting geometry, right? Because you had two, yeah. two cylinder like diagrams that are canceling. Yeah. They're the only cylinder diagram like things. And That's so right. That's right. It sounds like it's the same as saying we don't have any. Yeah, that, that's, I mean, it was a bit, it's a bit non-trivial that it, because um, the fact that the mapping class group sort of works trivially on these, on these, um, uh, on these external legs, um, that this was possible to all orders in the genus expansion. Um, um, but yeah. And furthermore, um, even with this factorization of the leading genus zero wormhole, um, the uh, higher order brain correlators or the multi-boundary brain correlators um, will also be zero. And the argument is, uh, is as follows. So suppose we have a three boundary uh, observable. Then again, on each of these external legs, um, we can even put some sigma here, but for simplicity, I just uh, wanted to just flash this uh, simple geometry. So with each of these lags, we can um, um, we have these contributions to the JT uh, to, the, to our path integral. Um, there's three possibilities of putting the uh, brain correlator on one of these lags. Three possibilities of putting it on two. One possibility of putting it on all three. And then there's the trivalent vertex that um, that we can also include in, in our model. Sorry, what's that trivalent vertex? Is that in the is that that would be a brain um, uh, a three boundary um, wave function on these boundaries? But so, that doesn't introduce a term that's trilocal and uh, potential. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to argue that there that it's zero. So I, I'm, I'm starting with the the a, a dilaton gravity action that contains um, bilocal, trilocal, everything. Yeah. And then I'm with this argument. This shows that there's no trivalent, there's no fourvalent, or, uh, or yeah. But you don't have to tune or... that last term. That last term looks like a new kind of interaction or something where you're going right. to have to tell us what happens at that dot. And, and you're not going to get zero unless you tune what happens at that dot, right? Well, um, I know that from if I demand factorization, so we're still demanding factorization, and I want to know what type of dilaton gravity factorizes. 
So I'm still going to require that this is zero. Yeah, but just, I just wonder about the last term in the sum. Is that zero by itself? Uh, you can you can have it to be non-zero, but then you won't have a factorizing theory. Okay, so you, you say it's zero even if I don't include that last term. That's what you're saying in the sum you wrote here. By demanding factorization, this will be demanding factorization sets the sum of all of those terms to zero. Yeah, yeah these, these first four yeah. are already zero. Okay, that's what I was asking. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so this is one. This we replace this again with the with the connected jump with the, the purely geometric contribution, but with a minus sign and for these other uh, two terms as well. So we got minus one, minus one, minus three, plus three, minus one, zero, um, to some identity in the using binomial coefficients. Um, and so that means that this brain two point, uh, three point function uh, must vanish. Oh, so, last question. Yeah. Before you gave us an argument that you expect a, a generic UV theory when you integrate stuff out, you get bilocal complex. Shouldn't you also expect to get trilocal and so on? Yeah, sorry. So in the beginning, I was talking about the results. Yeah. So here I'm just taking a general dilaton, non-local dilaton gravity, which includes bilocal, trilocal, everything. And then I'm, with uh, factorization, I'm trying to constrain the form of that, um, of that action. And so what I'm telling you guys now is that um, the uh, bilocal term is non-zero, but the trilocal, quadrilocal, uh, they're all zero. Right. So, so this means if you wanted to reproduce this in a UV theory, your UV theory would also have to have all of these things disappear yeah. when you integrate it out. Yeah. Do, do you know of any reason why that should be the case? Um, no. Um, okay, so the conclusion here about demanding factorization is that uh, the C-brain uh, correlator takes this particular and very simple and universal form um, to demand to get factorization to all orders. Um, and consequently, um, the dilaton potential is just bilocal. All right. So now let's move on to, um, uh, to discreteness. So discreteness is a question about the uh, partition function itself. Um, so let's apply the lessons that we learned from factorization, from demanding factorization, to this particular observable. All right, so we have all these contributions um, that, that you can have. There can be many more, but I drew here a couple. Now, um, the first two, the first, uh, the third and fourth geometry, they cancel uh, precisely because of the reason that I um, told you guys before. This is again a cycle that's homotopic to the boundary. Now, this, the fifth and sixth geometry, they also cancel for exactly the same reason, and then this um, this trilocal interaction also vanishes. And so that means that the disk or the, or the partition function is just given by the disk and um, uh, this half wormhole geometry. And now the, the thing that is not fixed is the brain one point function or the the single boundary wave function, Z brain of B. <clears throat> Here I wrote this in, in, in a formula. We have Z of beta is the disk uh, partition function plus uh, a trumpet uh, glued to a, uh, a wave function, Z brain of B. Now what we want is uh, Z of beta uh, to be trace e to the minus beta H naught. I'm sorry, Where? maybe this is obvious, but why aren't you including geometries with more holes? Are you just saying those are suppressed in the genus expansion or something? Like oh, those, will, those will also cancel because imagine I have like to explain that. I missed it. All right. Maybe I can just flash it one more. Well, look at these two. Oh, I, I see. Okay, I got you. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 All right, so what we want to re reproduce is um, Z of beta to be a trace e to the minus beta H naught, where H naught is a typical draw 
from the JT ensemble. I'm reproducing this formula again here. And now you notice this sort of cute formula that um, says that um, when I integrate this, this, this particular cosine against the JT trumpet, you just get a single, uh, a single exponential. I mean, this is just uh, the density of states of, of the trumpet partition function. So that shouldn't be too surprising. Um, so you get a single exponential. And so if we take our Z brain to contain these type of terms, we can reproduce a discrete uh, uh, spectrum. So the upshot is, gonna, is, is that the brain one point function is given by a sum over these cosines. So here I wrote a trace. This trace is over uh, H naught. This, or you can read it as the eigenvalues of H naught. And then I'm subtracting off here uh, the disk contribution. Um, so that I just recover the sum over, um, sum over Boltzmann factors. So that fixes the one point function. So uh, now a few, a few comments. Um, this Z brain is uh, sensitive uh, to H naught, depends uh, sort of sensitively on it. If H naught is a typical draw from the JT ensemble, these brain corrections are going to be small because on average the disk will, will cancel. Um, and furthermore, when I average again over H naught, you get back all these Val Peterson volumes. Uh, and that's because of this particular cosine. Uh, has a nice property when you stick that into the matrix integral. Um, furthermore, um, U, the potential, so the local piece of the chains in the Dilaton action um, uh, is suppressed uh, for a typical draw. So that's again, small, and it takes this, uh, this form. So smallness means here that the C brain will be order, order one um, for a typical draw. And so here, you can see that, um, so this correction to the dilaton action contains these type of terms. So it's uh, e to the minus two pi phi cos b phi. So it's sort of an analytic continuation of the corrections that you would get from the defect. Yeah. How do you define the trace of the formula for Z brain of B? It, it wasn't really convergence. Yeah, this this expression. Yes. What do you make? How do you make sense of that? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I think here I have in, uh, I have in mind just summing over all the eigenvalues of uh, of this that's, H naught. That series doesn't converge. That's true. Um, so there might be corrections to this. I, I guess for the in the matrix model uh, description, you can just work at the finite L and then take a. Take a double scaling limit if you wish. I, I agree that um, this expression perhaps needs some uh, some more care. All I'm saying here is that there is a this brain one point function will be fixed by demanding this discreteness. Um, and yeah, up to that issue that you're saying about the trace. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, this is the, the the answer for Z brain that gives you. Uh, in in the matrix integral, this uh, this object uh, we had studied that with, with Luca and Akash and uh, Shenman, and that this expression seems to make some some sense in the matrix integral. But uh, I agree with you that uh, there's some divergence issue. Yeah, but also the second term is divergent of the disk when you integrate cosine with the sinh. This this yeah, is so the difference is the only thing that. That, it, that is true, um, but I mean, this will uh, be large uh, and this will also be large and you need to cancel it. I mean, it has to either cancel rather, um, like if you calculate averages of, of Z brain, you integrate again over H naught, you'll just find something that is the, the genus expansion for the, uh, for the disk partition function. That's what I was mentioning about this earlier work with Luca and Jamin and <clears throat> All right, but let me uh, go on. Um, 
Now, this, this half wormhole, as I've been telling you guys about uh, this Z brain is, is suppressed. And so this half wormhole uh, is subleading um, in the disk partition function in the uh, partition function. And so the black hole is often a good approximation to, to the observables that you're interested in. Um, for an atypical draw, the brain corrections will be large and you don't reproduce the usual JT results. Now this um, uh, factorization can also be implemented in matrix integral using a particular double trace deformation. I won't have time to talk about that. Um, there's some interesting thing that we found that if you put in this double trace deformation, uh, that it already gives you a discrete spectrum. Who wants to know more about that? Then you can either look at the paper or um, ask me or Luca um, during the conference. So some final remarks. So factorization uh, implies that the um, uh, brain, uh, uh, brain correlators are Gaussian. They're Gaussian with this, uh, with this minus sign this minus one over p um, and discreteness fixes uh, the z brain one point function now the same can be done also for self-averaging quantities and even when you include matter or pro matter um, we have a proposal of how such a theory would factorize you can basically run the same argument but then you need to be careful about what type of boundary state you're going to put at the geodesic end um, then the problem is you can uh, you can show that you can indeed get uh, say a two point function in a discrete theory and um, some self averaging quantity that Luca will be talking about is the, the, the volume of the interior um, you can also see that um, that is correctly reproduced by uh, in our factor in our factorizing theory that will also give you the, the correct result the brain corrections are again small. Uh, now, one sort of outlook slide, um, um, which, so this mechanism that I presented, um, it's rather, we think it's rather natural and uh, could be maybe applied to, to other cases, to maybe higher dimensional cases as well. So it sort of highlights the fact that closed universes are uh, important. So for instance, in the calculation with the brains, um, uh, we saw that these type of contributions are, are important and they uh, cause um, a correlation between parts uh, of some geometries that have an asymptotic boundary and geometries that don't have an asymptotic boundary. Um, and likewise, in, in terms of the deformed dilaton potential, so that's up here, we have a non-local, uh, uh, a bilocal term, and this bilocal term causes um, also geometries with, uh, with an asymptotic boundary to be correlated with closed universes. So for instance, as, as I've drawn here, uh, usually in ADS CFT, we don't care about these um, closed universes because they're gonna cancel in any uh, correlation for any observable that you're trying to compute. Um, but here, because we have this bilocal uh, term, they're gonna be important and from what I've shown you, these are relevant for, uh, or we believe they're relevant for resolving the factorization puzzle. Uh, one other uh, comment here is that since it's bilocal, you can also have a Sotanovich, this um, bilocal interaction into a local one. Then the dilaton potential depends on some uh, additional field. This field will not depend on space time coordinate. Um, so it's like a global field that you integrate over. But it nevertheless is a parameter in the dilaton potential um, that you're integrating over. And so what that means is that um, you're averaging over bulk couplings. So it's sort of funny that um, this bulk average cancels the boundary average. Uh, and again, here, the closed universes are important uh, because this ratio uh, will care about, um, will care about these uh, these closed universes. And so perhaps this is a different description of uh, the non gravitational uh, theories that we know that, okay, maybe there's a UV complete description in terms of strings and brains, but perhaps there's another uh, perspective where you view it just as a geometric theory, but with bilocal interactions.
Uh, and that's all I wanted to tell you guys about. Thanks a lot. meant about the double phase definition and also i don't think you quite told us the bilocal potential to find yeah that, that will be um you use the function of phi that produces yeah so, so this is the this term creates these geodesic boundaries and so if we have a bilocal one we would have two of these terms, and then two integrals of the B, and then this Z brain B1, B2. So I'm just sticking in the Z brain uh, B1, B2. There was a delta function that localizes onto a single um, B integral. I don't have space here to, to write it. But. Didn't you have a formula on the first or second slide that was more explicit? I can also go there. No. I think I understand. What you're integrating over B, an operator that produces a geodesic boundary of length B, and then you had a bilocal. Right. So, so since it's bilocal, they'll occur in pairs, which you can imagine being so together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so you have. Two of these uh, guys, one and a, uh, and another one with the same b, and then there's a single b integral. And what about the statement about the double trace definition? Right. So that that will definitely take some time to explain, um, which I I'd be happy to discuss that in in person offline. Um, but this double trace deformation is basically a version of the FCC T brain. So it's a, like a trace log term, but it's two trace log terms uh, multiplied together. So what did this effect, this has the effect of changing the uh, power of the van der Maanden, basically. And in the matrix integral, there's an additional parameter that emerges, uh, which is sort of natural why it, why it occurs. And we need that uh, to be large. And the fact that that parameter is becoming large sort of classicalizes the whole matrix integral, just focusing it on the, um, on a discrete spectrum. But yeah, I can explain that in more detail if you want. Um, but I have I have no formulas here. It will be a bit hard to explain in a bit more detail. Yeah. You have a question from the online audience, Alex? Of course. Yeah. Hey, Yorit. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm here. yeah great. Um, so I wanted to ask a question about adding matter. You had some small comment about that at the end. So yeah. if you do add matter and you want to compute correlation functions, then you no longer only care about the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, but you also care about the basis. And for example, the relative basis change between the eigenbasis of an operator and that of the Hamiltonian. That mm -hmm. looks like it requires a lot more parameters for your brain one point function. How would it work? Um, so we only discussed um, matter in the probe limit. So, um, um, so basically, we're, we're just using, for instance, the techniques that, that Phil and Jemin and uh, Herman et al. Uh, worked out. Um, <coughs> and in that case, you can. Are you worried about these, um, these uh, O of E1, E2 type terms? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, if you're really in random matrix theory, the change of basis between that of an operator and the Hamiltonian is basically a random unitary. Um, but if you're no longer in truly RMT and you have some fixed Hamiltonian, then that basis change is fixed. But that's, you know, that's e to the 2s parameters, not e to the s parameters, roughly speaking. So I'm just wondering how that gets captured by your potential or, or your brain one point function. This brain, brain one point function um, to demand factorization. This brain one point function is the is an arbitrary function. So I can also fit in those parameters that you that you're talking about, and still get uh, get a discrete spectrum that will be uh, JT plus a scalar field, whatever the UV completion of that is, uh, that has some discrete spectrum on the boundary. I would take that spectrum 
um, and stick that into the C brain one point function. I see. So you would double the number of parameters, but it would still work. That, that's what you're saying. Maybe I can make a small comment. Yeah, sure. Which is that we computed sure. uh, we computed the matter um, correlators in the probe limit, which I think is what you're referring to with this OE1, E2, and the change of basis. And we did get the correct result, which which is that if we uh, take an ensemble average over A0 again, we reproduce the correct matter correlators to all orders in the genus expansion. Yeah. So we don't actually need to change our Z brain one point function. Okay, you have the time. Let's uh, thank Jared again.